Hello and welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's program about a fascinating new book, The Ravine, A Family of Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. I'm excited about our program today with Professor Wendy Lauer, one of the leading Holocaust historians in America, to talk about her new book, which has received high praise in reviews all across the country. The book starts with a rare photograph that captures the murder of a Jewish woman and her child that was taken on October 13th, 1941 in the Ukraine during the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Professor Lauer then traces her own archival detective work as she uncovers details about the photograph and the history it shows, offering a deeply moving exploration into the history of the Holocaust as it unfolded in the Soviet Union. Before I introduce Professor Lauer and ask her to share more details with us about her book, let me put in a plug and some advertisements for some of our other upcoming virtual programs. This coming Sunday at one o'clock, we are holding the third program in our series about the Catskills on the big and small screen. HMTC's scholar in residence, Dr. Linda Burkhart, will talk about the way the Catskills is portrayed in the classic film Dirty Dancing. Next week on Tuesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m., we're holding a cooking demonstration, actually a baking demonstration with Chef Jake Cohen, who's gonna be showing how to make his great aunt's kosher for Passover meringue cookies, taking a recipe from Central Europe and bringing it to America. And one more program to mention, next Wednesday at noon, I'll be holding my next Curator's Corner, which in honor of Women's History Month, will focus on a watercolor in our collection that was painted by Marietta Grunbaum, one of the 15,000 children who passed through the ghetto in Theresienstadt. I'll talk about the painting and more broadly about the experiences of children during the Holocaust. So three very different programs that I hope give you a sense of the breadth of our programming. If you're interested in learning more about these or any of our programs, you can find it on our website at www.hmtcli.org. Okay, let's get to today's program. I'm gonna plop that down. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Wendy Lauer, the John K, sorry, the John K. Roth Professor of History at Claremont McKenna College, where she also serves as the director of the Magrubian Center for Human Rights. Um, oops, I'll just... Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, Professor Lauer is one of the leading Holocaust historians in the country. For this semester, she is serving as the William Rosenberg Senior Scholar at Yale University, but she's also the chair of the Academic Committee of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. and currently serves as the acting director of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center, Mandel Center for Adva the Advanced for Advanced Holocaust Studies, really the premier center for Holocaust research in the country. She's the author of a number of books, including most famously. Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, which came out in 2013 and was a finalist for the National Book Award and drew our attention to the previously largely ignored participation of women in the Holocaust, even as murderers. Her new book approaches the Holocaust in a very different way by focusing, as I said, on a single photograph as its starting point. But I will leave it to Professor Lauer to tell us more about that photograph and how and what she uncovered about it. One more comment from me before we let's get started. We wanna engage you in our discussion, are you out there? And so if you have questions, please use the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll get Professor Lauer to take a look at your and respond to your questions. Okay, so with that introduction and probably more yapping than you wanted, uh, let me welcome Professor Lauer. Thank you very much for being here. Really a pleasure to have you on our program. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so impressed with all the activities in Nassau County under your leadership. Uh, just looking at the upcoming programs. Uh, my mouth was watering about the cookies and I just, I love the way you're involving people, you know, in spite of, in spite of all the uh, obstacles during this pandemic and keeping people connected um, and learning. So hats off to you for all you're doing for your audiences and for your community. Um, and I so appreciate the opportunity to talk about my new book. So thank you, Thorin. <laughs> um, I know you wanted to, you wanted to, or I mean, I've said something about the book, but you can give us a little more of an introduction to it. Yeah, just a little bit, just a few words about what inspired 
me to write this story. Um, and then we're going to get into a more of a discussion format. Um, and I have some slides too to show you since it's about a photograph. I think it's important to actually show the photograph. It's a very disturbing photograph. So I do want to um, signal that to our audiences um, that it is um, a photo, an atrocity photograph that we'll be studying today. And we've all seen how one photograph of suffering or violence can move audiences and propel humanitarian action and social justice. Iconic images that come to your mind perhaps of a naked girl fleeing a napalm attack in Vietnam, or we remember a little Alan Kurdi in his red t-shirt who washed up on that Turkish beach, um, the Honduran girl crying while her mother was being searched at the US-Mexico border, um, Jewish Holocaust victims kneeling over pits um, in Ukraine, railway lines leading to the entrance of Birkenau. So there are all these images that become part of our kind of collective memory of historical disasters and um, uh, atrocities. And they are often widely circulated and displayed, especially now in the internet age um, with little information. And sometimes they are commercialized. The one image I just referred to, which is called the last Jew in Vinitsa of a man um, being, being shot by a, a German security official uh, around a crowd of people, of uh, Nazis basically. Um, that was recently reprinted on t-shirts and mugs and by an anti-Semitic organization. So as a scholar, I was offended by the fact that a lot of these images are in circulation. We don't know about the circumstances or persons pictured in them, usually even less about the photographer, um, and that these photographs become kinds of stand-ins and standard illustrations, but they're not studied as historical documents. Um, so I, I kind of pose this question, you know, when one is presented with such a powerful photograph, what is our ethical, how shall we respond to that? What are the methods of inquiry? Um, and could visual evidence in this case, a single photograph, open up new lines of discovery about the Holocaust? And, you know, what resources do we have available to us, both intellectual and material, um, to bring a picture to life and to help us understand what's going on in that image. Yeah, super. Uh, do you, I know you said you have a PowerPoint. Do you wanna show us some of the, the picture? I mean, it's- Yeah, let me open that up now. And there we go. Okay. Um, so here is the photograph um, from October 13th, 1941, as Thorne mentioned in the introduction, from Ukraine, Mirpol, Miropil. Um, it is about 130 miles west of Kiev, uh, so kind of central Ukraine, but on in what is considered Western Ukraine, a Western region, uh, historically, where the Pale of Settlement was established by the Tsar, so high population densities. Uh, Jewish dens population densities here and historic shtetl uh, life. This particular town, Mirapol, was um, the setting for a very famous Yiddish play, the Dibuk. Um, ethnographers had gone in there before the First World War to try to capture this vanishing, uh, the vanishing shtetl. Um, and so uh, in, in all aspects of it, the, the culture as well as the poverty and the, um, and the uh, uh, developments in the shtetl as far as um, assimilation and the war and all that. So this this particular town, uh, while it seems like you know you you if you were driving down the highway, you might not turn off and and venture into this uh, rural uh, community, um, but it does have significance in the history of of Jewish life and culture in the former Soviet Union and what was the um, Pale of Settlement. So that's significant. And but here we have you know the the ultimate horrific act of genocide happening in that space. Um, with the woman in the center of the photo holding the child's hand, the barefooted boy, um, and in nature, in broad daylight, the light is passing through the trees. You can see nature is being put to work here. I thought it was a ravine. It turns out it was actually a pit that was dug. There was a ravine in town that was used for mass murder operations. The Germans put nature to work. They understand this is not the camp system. This is what happened to the Holocaust by bullets, what happened to uh, almost half of the victims of the Holocaust in these shootings. And you can see collaboration on full in full view here. Um, the uh, men, the local militia with their armbands in these with our Red Army coats and their rifles, 
uh, and the uh, Germans in their uniforms with their insignia uh, and their shoulder to shoulder carrying out this uh, horrific act against this against this family. Um, those Ukrainians knew uh, the Jewish uh, people they were murdering. They, they called them by name. Um, and we knew when we when I first found this photograph or it was shown to me, um, what was very important was that the name of the photographer, the location and the date were part of the uh, uh, materials. So that was a place to start. Yeah, can I ask you, I know you describe in the book how two journalists, two young journalists gave you this picture back in 2009. Well, what was your immediate reaction to when you saw it? Was it, I, I think you described that there's only a, there's a relatively finite number of these, these shots, these photographs of, of kind of documenting the murder uh, during that Holocaust by bullets. Was that what came onto your mind? What were you thinking when you first saw it? When I first saw it, I actually focused on the killers. I was at the archives working on an investigation of an SS off, former SS officer who was still at large. And, and I had met with him and I knew uh, he uh, was a, a major suspect in, outside of Frankfurt. So at that moment in 2009, the pursuit of justice was still happening. It was extremely late, obviously, but uh, in Germany, cases were being opened and to this day they are being pursued. Uh, actually, a, a secretary, a clerk from the Stutthof camp right now was recently indicted. We just deported um, uh, a Nazi uh, perpetrator, uh, just um, a case here in the Justice Department was just concluded. So th this is still happening and I, it was clear to me that the victims, um, you know, I, I wanted to identify them, but uh, what the only action that could be taken on this photo immediately was to, I, to identify the killers and potentially um, find them. Uh, and so when I, you know, some of them were young. In fact, one of the Ukrainians was 17 years old um, conducting this, this operation and, and murdering. Um, so could still be alive. I mean, I was talking to Holocaust survivors <laughs> And, and a perpetrator. I mean, they, you know, um, these individuals are, are still around, obviously. Um, and so that was my first inclination. And the fact that this Ukrainian um, to the right is so clearly in a shooting position um, and firing his gun, and I had been reading in the literature and in my first book, um, uh, kind of um, was misled in a way by the testimony and didn't have enough evidence to prove that in fact um, Ukrainians were also shooting um, because that was also uh, refuted that they actually did the shooting. It was minimized as, oh, they were standing guard and they got involved in the looting and maybe they were involved in some pogroms that was historically kind of explained. Um, but the act of being shoulder to shoulder like that with the, with the Germans to me was really um, eye-opening. Yeah. So, so from the beginning, you were thinking this is evidence. This is really something that could still be used. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned, and, and I want to follow up, that it came with the knowledge of, or with the information about when it was taken and the photographer's name. What were you able to find out about this photographer? Is the photographer, I'm assuming he's not still alive? What were no. you able to find out about him? Um, the photographer died in 2005, and he was born in 1916. His name was Lubomir Skrovina. Um, now, I hadn't done any work. I'd worked on Ukraine and uh, the Baltics and Germany, Nazi Germany. I hadn't done really any work on um, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia. Uh, I worked very closely with a survivor for many years, Helen Tischauer, uh, Helen Spitzer Tischauer, who was from Bratislava. So I knew a little bit of her story uh, among the first to be deported to Auschwitz in March 42. So I understood the story of Tizo and that Ukrainian collaboration. But now I was suddenly, you know, here's a Slovakian on the ground um, in uniform, part of the security uh, forces that were supplementing the Germans as the Germans moved farther east and, 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 and you know, as the campaign advanced militarily, these Slovak forces were brought in as kind of reinforcements. And I had read about them years ago, but I just, it didn't really uh, register with me that these Slovakians were um, present at these uh, massacres. I was, um, and, and in fact, uh, I would later find out that these are not Einsatzgruppen, these are finance, part of the finance ministry. So as far as the perpetrators in this photo, um, as I delved into that um, and the uh, idea of collaboration, different things started to come to life in terms of participation. Now the photographer, uh, I thought of, you know, Slovakian, part of the collaborating forces, 
one of Father Tizo's agents, kind of on the ground in Ukraine, um, open photo, stable photo, not taken clandestinely, even even composed in a way, like a rule of thirds. I can see um, that this is something that he probably had permission to take. Um, and then I was offended by you know the fact that he's standing there with his camera, like the men standing with their guns, and that those victims, if they were even um, conscious of it or could even register given the trauma they're going through, like that they were also getting their picture taken was another act of humiliation. So I'd assume that the photographer was part of this um, uh, operation as a collaborator. And in fact, he was not. Um, and that was probably one of the biggest surprises in the book. Uh, and I, um, with the help of my colleagues at the Holocaust Museum, um, I gave them a lot of my uh, documentation. I gave them the kind of sketch of my book. And um, they were looking for uh, artifacts in Eastern Europe for the collection at the museum. And I said, wow, this guy was a photographer. Maybe we can find out more. And one of my colleagues um, uh, who has the language skills uh, went through social media and everything, was able to find the family and, and track down um, the, the, the fact that the photographer's family still resided in the same house where he was you know, during the war. Um, so that was helpful. And, um, and I connected with the a family and interviewed them. And you know, when you'll see in the book, I actually was able to obtain the, the camera itself and study that as another uh, source. So he was not a political person. He, he became political because he was so morally outraged. He didn't, he didn't belong to any political party. He hated wearing a uniform. Um, so he was, um, you know, this was obligatory service. He was writing letters to his wife um, and they were together in the resistance and he, he hated this war. He was disgusted. He was having nightmares. He took this photograph. This is his visual testimony of here is the war that we are fighting. And for him, it was the war that had to stop and the war that was a warning. And this picture is his warning to us. And he brought this image back to his hometown and showed it to the Jewish community, hid Jews in his attics, and this do not go when they call you for deportations. This is what's happening. Um, and so he turned out to be a really um, appealing figure, a very admirable figure. He couldn't rescue, he couldn't save these Jews, but he changed his behavior from this point onward. It's amazing that you were able to to follow that up. And in the book, when you talk about finding the camera and, and meeting the family, it's it's really a powerful section. Um, you know, just I, I was uh, reading some of the reviews and Deborah Lipstadt, as I'm sure you know, she described your book as micro and macro history at its very best, which I completely agree to. As soon as I read that, I was like, yes, that's what this is. Yeah. So can you tell us a little about the macro here? Can you broaden out from this one picture and just give us a little of that context about what's going on in 1941 and, and what, what the photo helps us understand more clearly? About yeah, that? thank you for that. Um, uh, before we were all conversant in Zoom, and the word Zoom was as common as the word Google, um, I, was, I was describing this as I was proposing the book project and thinking through the concept of it. I was like talking about Zooming in because of camera work and Zooming out, right? So what I do is I, I kind of go in and I look at the pieces, uh, very kind of micro level of what is it that's in here that will provide a certain clue. So empty shoes, and here we have some, some documents. There are something, papers. Of course, we have technology now to actually zoom in and zoom out um, and get into some really high resolution and look at different angles. But this is very this very haunting image of the shoes and the iconography and Holocaust memorialization of absence and silences and the search for the missing that we see. So on, on a meta, kind of metaphorical level, on the uh, broader level, that the, the power of those shoes um, the landscape, as I mentioned, and the fact that in Holocaust studies, we're doing a lot more with um, uh, forensics and forensic archaeology. And what is, does that mean, um, not only in the Holocaust, but, but more broadly, as we read in contemporary cases about um, horrific uh, acts of cruelty, whether it's in the Congo or um, uh, in Rwanda in, in the 90s, of why the genocide heirs go that extra step of sadistic acts of forcing family members to die with their loved ones to witness the suffering of their of their loved ones and why are genocide heirs 
um, in these ultimate cases of, of ultimate destruction and annihilation, obsessed with the family and the genealogy of the family and the, mat the, the, continue the racism of this, right? The biological racism of this. And, um, you know, Hitler had said, so I was, this is October 1941. In my book, I provide a chronology that puts this in this bigger context. October 41 is, these are those fateful months, those are those fateful days, really, and turning points when the Nazis um, pursued the killing um, as the final solution, as they described it, not kind of, um, you know, attrition or death by neglect in the, gen in the ghettos. But now the killers, they're hunting down the Jews. Look at these rifles. They're going to these locations. The camps are now, and, and the filling, killing centers are going to be constructed at this moment too. The architectural plans and the plot for Belzets, the first mass gassing facility that opened in March 42. At the moment of this picture, um, you know, we've got Nazi officials going out and scope and surveying that land, you know, that those gassing facilities while they are carrying out um, these mass shootings and going to the to the victims in these small town settings. Hitler said to his collaborator, uh, Croatian collaborator in July 1941, the same time when Himmler is telling his men to drive women into the swamps of Belarus and, and make sure, Himmler says, make sure you kill the women and children because they will avenge the deaths of their fathers and brothers. And Hitler's telling his Croatian ally, not one Jewish family is to remain in Europe. We, he, he said, we, like, we basically made this mistake, we made this mistake before in expulsions of the Jews, they always come back, um, but we, we Germans are going to do this, you know, to the, to, to the end. Um, and so that obsession, kind of biological obsession with root and branch genocide, which is how genocide scholars describe that um, uh, kind of uh, extreme. And, and I see that, this is what I see in this, in this image, and I went back to uh, Lemkin's writings and thought, you know, thought about to what extent the family figures in this history as a unit, both of, of, of what the genocides target and the victims as they experience a genocide in this most horrific way. Yeah, nicely said. Um, I see somebody is asking a question just about the photographer going back to that topic. And were there other photos taken? Oh, there we go. <laughs> were there other taken by this photographer? And what did you, what else did you find other than the camera? Mm. Well, here's a picture of our photographer, a rather dashing man in this image. This is not long after the war. So I do have a couple of wartime images his family shared with me. And, and there is uh, the camera. Um, and he's part of this camera craze in the 1920s and 30s. That's a Zeiss icon, but these pocket cameras were patented in the, in the 20s and 30s. And um, million, we have millions of photographs from the Second World War. It's one of the most uh, photographed and 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 the and the uh, Holocaust as well. We have hundreds of thousands of images. So Scrovi now to put him in his context is part of the rise of you know, popular hobby photography, and um, he was the scribe, the company scribe for his unit. So he actually had an official reason to have a camera. He was documenting the kind of history of their unit as they, as they moved into across Ukraine, um, and and they were following in the wake of a lot of these atrocities that the Nazis had carried out. Um, along that path there um, towards Kiev and eventually to Stalingrad. Um, so Shkrovina is like drafted, he gets married right before he's put in, uh, placed into service and deployed, he gets married to a Czech woman, which is interesting because there was a lot, Slovakia now is there's a lot of anti-Czech sentiment um, and um, the Czechs were considered more kind of um, you know, Western leaning and we had the Czech government in exile and so She's part of his wife is part of a Czech minority in the historic areas of Slovakia. Um, so he's taking a risk right there by actually marrying her, which is interesting. Um, uh, and they seem to have a, a beautiful relationship, as far as I can tell from the letters and interviewing his parent, his children. And so he's sent into this battle, um, Operation Barbarossa, um, with his camera. And in the archives, um, so this this camera could take seven prints the, the film that he had. Um, and there are five that the KGB confiscated when they um, stormed his apartment and started questioning him as a collaborator in 1958. And, but in the archives, there are more um, uh, because his comrades in that unit were part of a raid, part of a sweep in the, in the 1950s and the part of the Soviets, you know, to arrest these fascists, former fascists. 
And so he's brought in and questioned in 58, um, um, and they take his negatives and they take his prints. Um, he's hidden some, he's able to hide some from the authorities, but um, this is how they end up in the archives. This is how I end up getting him, ironically, was because it was part of his, uh, that he was um, questioned. When he went back um, in um, Tabanska B Street uh, at the end of 41, um, in 1943, um, Skrovina, with these photos, as I mentioned, was warning Jews that this was the war, uh, the Holocaust. And he hid this family in his attic. One of them was a doctor, and he actually delivered his son, Lubin Jr., in 1943. He helped Skrovina um, contributed to the Slovakian resistance effort when the Nazis came in in late 44, um, uh, August 44. Um, he brought Jews, uh, the Jewish families, to the woods, to hiding places. Not all of them survived, but he was part of this kind of, um, you know, currying service and, and providing information. He had a radio shop, so he had valuable technical skills and materials, copper wires, and uh, he had a car, <laughs> which is really important. So that history of his wartime resistance, you know, saved him. He ultimately was given a medal for that and recognized for that. So when he was interrogated, he was able to, you know, um, uh, he was not incarcerated. And, um, but the uh, investigation yielded more of the photographs that some of his colleagues had also taken. So there's a little bit of a, an, uh, an archive there in Prague of these images from this unit. And it's these atrocity images, the one that I just showed you that are part of that. And I found five, I could, I could determine that five were of his, uh, from this massacre, were ones that he had created. Um, and they show, um, I mean, if it's interesting when you think about the eye of the photographer, you know, as the eye of history, as an expression of, of testimony, visual testimony, and you look at those images which are printed in the book, you can see that he's trying to narrate for us like sequentially what happened. It's not just like random pictures. It's the Jews on the path who resisted, who were killed, you know, the Jews who were killed at the pit and then images of the actual um, victims in the, in, the, in the pit at the end um, and images of, of the perpetrators. Uh, one thing I should add is that he had the power to create and to crop, you know, these images. Uh, when he printed them. And I don't know um, if there were other, I know there was another, at least another Slovakian with him. Um, he refers to his comrade when he was went to the scene with his camera to check out what was going on. Um, and I don't, they're not, I don't see other Slovakians. The only Slovakian we know of there is the man behind the camera. <laughs> but in the testimony, we know that others were there and they're not in his images. And so I wonder, you know, if he was protecting his comrades too by cropping them out. It's just, we... I know that, it, and you, you just said it, but I, I wanna highlight it. The, um, you talk about how that, that chronology that he shows in that set of photographs really does highlight a story that includes resistance. And um, it's an image that you point out, you know, we often have this image, perhaps a false image in our mind of the Jews just kind of silently being marched off and shot and not protesting. But, but these photos, as you talk about this other photo, really shows that there was resistance even in this little remote town. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, they, they, they was, you know, from the, sorry, the one uh, testimony that we have of a survivor, uh, and these are such rare sources because again, I mean, one out of every fourth victim who was murdered in the Holocaust died in on the terrain of what is you know ukraine what is ukraine's borders resided in what is today's today's ukraine um and that's over a million we don't like about half of them have not been identified most of them children the nazis didn't you know these these guys were local volunteers uh, there was there's no there's so little uh written documentation on what happened like this is this is how we get access to that event otherwise but one a Jewish woman, girl at the time, survived, crawled out of the pit. Ludmilla Blackman has the most amazing, she, she deserves her own book, her testimony and her story. Um, and it, it features quite uh, prominently in, in, my, in my book. But she has incredible accounts of, of resistance in those scenes. And the, the family, I mean, that the fathers, um, the struggle to protect your family and your, your wife and your child. And those kinds of um, interventions that got down to like families trying to protect their loved ones um, 
including her father trying to protect her. And, and that's just important, I think, to, to take note of. Yeah. Um, you know, the, you, we've been talking about, and you've been talking about the photographer, but amazingly, you're also able in this book to identify some of the perpetrators. And could you tell us a little more about what you found out about them and how you were able to identify them from, I mean, it's not a super crisp image, but it's also, you know, it's not easy to identify them. Either. No, I, um, let me go up to, so yeah, it's hard to see their faces. Um, I, I can just see a little bit of their uniforms. I had to really study the, the cuffs, the caps, the insignia, you know, is this a, an eagle? Is it what's on the cap? It's not a skull, uh, which is kind of an SS marking. I don't see the markings of Waffen SS. I didn't see Einsatzgruppen, um, Sicherheitsdienst. Uh, I couldn't, I thought it, from this image, I thought it was order police, order police 303 swept through there. I ended up um, that was a rabbit hole I was in for a while, um, going through thousands and thousands of pages because this one order police unit 303 um, was heavily investigated. It didn't lead anywhere, didn't go anywhere, but a lot of um, interrogations. And I was going through all these mug shots. It was crazy to think that I could match up these faces, but um, it was all I had. Um, but this other image uh, here, which is also one of Lubomir Skrobina's images, I mentioned that there are are five, and here you can recognize it's the same series. There's there's the shoes down there. There's that coat. Here's our here's our Ukrainians here. Um, then we have the the guy in the cap back there, and then another onlooker, an elbow. We don't know, but here I could get a better view of the of the German uniform as really really critical there, um, and the belt buckle. And there are finance guards, as I mentioned, and I know that they're finance guards, not because the German documentation kind of led me there. Um, surprisingly, but because our photographer, Skrovina, very clever, smart man, um, very observant, <laughs> in one of his um, interrogations, he talked about the German, he literally said the finance guards, you know, and this is unusual because because typically a non-German observer, including a, a survivor, would say, oh, the Gestapo, oh, and they would use, the Soviets would just use shorthand like, oh, Fritz, or you know, they, you know, the Hitler rights, you know, like you get these vague, they're not going to know exactly what unit it is, right? They might know different colored uniforms, but not, you know, all the, the bureaucracy of the Nazi system. So for this um, Slovakian to say finance guards, oh, okay. And that led me to the case of these customs officials, which was, didn't go anywhere, but it was West Germany, 1969 in January. Um, a little police station outside of Hanover. And one of the comrades, one of the former colleagues of these guys, walks into that police station and says, I'd like to report a crime. This is 1969. And, and then the police uh, officer on duty, you know, on the desk, pulls out this generic form for reporting a crime. I mean, it could have been anything. It could have been a traffic act, you know, it could have been a robbery in the town. But instead, he's typing up Mirapol 1941 victims. Jew, Jewish inhabitants, um, and that started an investigation in West Germany that lasted about a year, so it was pretty perfunctory, um, and only one of these killers um, could be found, the other one could not, but they didn't have this photo, this photo sitting in Prague, the Soviet um, investigators in Ukraine, because they're going to pursue justice as well on this case, um, uh, more, more successfully, um, but the Germans didn't have the photo, the Soviet Ukrainians didn't have the photo, and wow, you know, if this had come out in that case in 1969 and it existed, um, it might have had a different outcome. Yeah, and I will say there's a chapter in your book called Justice, and um, it's, it's, I mean, one of the more powerful sections for me was reading that, and, and that seems where you started in this process was was thinking this was evidence, thinking this was going to help lead to justice. But uh, can you tell us a little more about the end of that story and, and the justice? And maybe what, what does justice look like in the Holocaust? Mm. That's a great question. Uh, well, there's justice that we can be pursued in a traditional formal sense in, in the courtroom. Um, and wow, to think about what that looks like when I uh, you know, consider all the incredible uh, history and literature on the pursuit of justice across Europe, 
um, and really around the world, including the United States, as far as the OSI and deportation of criminals and Demyanyuk and, and whatnot. Um, it's, a, it's an enormous history. It's a, a subfield in Holocaust um, and genocide studies because each country goes about it in a different way. Uh, and if you're a former kind of perpetrator country, um, there are all kinds of um, constraints or there's a kind of unwillingness or kind of political breaks and legal discussions about statute of limitations and privacy. And um, so there are often a lot of obstacles to what we think of as justice. In a place like the Soviet Union, um, where the countries of the Union, Soviet Union have been uh, occupied and decimated and the death tolls reaching in the tens of millions, and you have um, massive participation of local population as collaborators providing that manpower, that support for the Germans. Some 100, at least 100,000 Ukrainians were in the police forces, the stationary police forces in these small towns like the one, like the one we're talking about here. And so they're very determined. There was no statute of limitations for Nazi war crimes in the Soviet Union, and they reinstituted a death penalty. So they're going after Nazis with a vengeance, the fascist beasts, um, and um, and the numbers you know, really um, evidence this when you have, you know, tens of thousands, some like 80,000 who were actually prosecuted, many more who were just swept up as traitors to the homeland, and, and that this pursuit of justice is going um, steadily till the end of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So our uh, Soviet, our Ukrainian killers, here they are in 1986, right? So um, a prosecutor, in the neighboring city of Chitomer, um, again, not having this photograph, um, but uh, undertaking a renewed pursuit of justice in the mid 80s during Glasnost, Perestroika. Um, uh, these stories are starting to come out. There's a little bit of a, more of a memorial culture that's, that's um, entering into the Soviet scene. Um, and he um, finds out that these uh, local militiamen are still at large. And um, he identifies, and this is one of them. And here his fingerprint. This is arrest, his arrest report. And this is a huge case by contrast. You know, I look at the West German cases like this thin the file. And the Soviet case is tens of thousands of pages. I mean, it's just a massive, massive um, uh, investigation. And ultimately, these Ukrainian policemen, former Ukrainian policemen, are forced to kind of reenact to go to back to Mirapol, to walk this, the steps that the Jews walked, to stand over that pit, to point, and we have this photographed as well, to point to where it happened. They also exhume um, the, the grave uh, because they want the evidence of, of the bones. Um, and on that occasion, they move some of these Jewish victims' bones, including the children, to a little memorial site and they rebury them and survivors come back um, and, and honor their uh, deceased loved ones in that way. So there's that kind of symbolic um, closure in a way for that um, community. So these are the these are the different ways that justice kinds of kind of, kind of emerges. Um, in this case, it involved the survivors, not the case in West Germany. By contrast, as I said, perfunctory didn't go anywhere. Um, these guys are uh, executed by firing squad. Um, the Ukrainian killers, two of them, three are put on trial. Um, the third was a youth, was a 17-year-old when he was doing a shooting, so he got 15 years in prison, sent into inner Russia, and Ukraine gets its independence in August 1991. So this is only about, you know, three or four years later. Uh, I don't know what happened to the last, uh, the killer uh, who was sent into the prison system where he, had, if he ever returned. Amazing, amazing that you were able to dig this stuff up. Um, I want to change topics a little. Uh, you write, I'm just going to read what uh, a brief sentence that you write. You said, researching the Holocaust is a form of excavation, digging for traces of a people driven to near extinction. Your excavation includes not just digging in the archives, but going to the Ukraine, to this town. Why, why was it important for you to identify in person where this photograph took place and to meet with these people who might have had some connection to this? Well, first of all, we knew, and I'd been working with this organization, Johan and Unum, and I can um, sing their praises and talk about them. Here's some other team here on the ground. I kind of mobilized them for this. Um, and I've worked with Father Debois and 
been very impressed by his work in Ukraine in particular in identifying a lot of mass graves um, and uh, writing the histories of what happened in these small communities and memorializing them and being very respectful as far as Jewish religious law. So I, but I wanted to see Debois' team kind of in action. I wanted to see, see for myself and participate in that as well. And so I gave them all my materials in the summer of 2016 and said, and I don't have the Ukrainian language skills. I have basic reading of Russian and Ukrainian. I couldn't, I had gone there in 2014 and I, with an interpreter, interviewed a wartime witness, but um, these guys had really come up with a system for efficiently collecting testimony. And, and that's what I wanted to, to do. Um, so I went with them and it was really remarkable. We had, we ended up finding about 18 people um, uh, who were present in October 41. Um, including a woman, now woman, elderly woman, who had been requisitioned by the Germans, forced a, sh a shovel spade put in her hand and said, dig, um, uh, otherwise kaput. I mean, that was just this, she was describing how, um, and they actually beat her mother in front of her. I mean, she had no choice. So she's brought there and um, to dig. And, and then, you know, a uh, Ukrainian peasant boy, hearing the bullets and, and hearing the screams and going and looking um, and observing um, and, and that that storytelling, that local memory, uh, which had to come out and we got it on film. And some of those Ukrainians, I showed them, um, here's one woman, she was in the marketplace um, when the night before when all the Jews were rounded up and forced to, to stay overnight and, um, and, and beaten and, and harassed and um and then here's the young now elderly guy he was the boy in the field and you know we're showing these images to him and he's recognizing um people i mean she's looking at this picture from this is a jewish family from mirapol that was i was trying to could be a match to the photo the little boy and she didn't recognize them but this woman she starts to say oh she starts listing other jewish family names which weren't in the archives so there was just this, this, this great um, opportunity while the memory is still there um, to add more information and to provide more information to um, this, this, this image that she's looking at. She recognized one of the women um, from town uh, had, had gone to the local soda fountain and, and remembered, you know, it's just, so the imagery conjured up a lot of, of memories for the local Ukrainians, which would otherwise be lost. So um, we went to the scene, this is where they were held. Uh, the Jews were held in this, in this police station and down below in the prison there um, and surrounded by the Ukrainians. Um, and here they were forced to march into, this is leading towards the actual site. And here we are going into the actual site. And we uncovered um, remains, Jewish uh, bone or bones of the victims. Um, it's an unprotected site. Uh, it's it's really uh, astounding if you if you stand and you look around. This maybe this image is not as revealing, but it's all these mounds and the vegetation is disrupted, um, and and just you can see the topography, um, what the scarring of the landscape um, that's that's visible. And then we just reached down and we uncovered the vertebrae and 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 skull fragments. And the reason why um, this, this had, I had not experienced this before uh, was because of that Soviet exhumation in the late 80s, which was conducted with really kind of brutally with um, trucks and like bulldozers. And, and that just pulled up the, the, the victim's remains and they it was not properly, um, they were not properly covered up. Say so they're using these trucks and I mean, I have to say, as from the reader's perspective, the way you describe being there and investigating and and following, you know, getting out of the car and walking through the woods, it really, it's 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 well done. I'm, I'm kind of brought there, and it makes it so much more powerful. And I'm I some of the viewers may know I always struggle with this uh, the power of place and why is it that that there is a power of place? But your your book certainly captures it, and that's just one of the one of the parts of the book that really makes it come alive. I think and makes this history much more tangible. Thank you. Um, I wanted to read another quote from you. You finish the book with a quote from Raoul Hilberg, 
And you write the re or he wrote the reality of events is elusive as it must be, and the unremitting effort continues for the small incremental gains, no matter their cost, lest all be relinquished and forgotten. And I just wanted to first of all, I would say your book doesn't seem like a small incremental gain. Uh, but what what struck you about that quote? What do you take away from it? Why why did you put it in there? Well, because I, I think that we're just, every day we're kind of chipping away at something, we're laboring at something in a way to get to the truth, to get to uncover these stories. Um, the magnitude of this, when we speak in millions, uh, the population of Kiev, you know, it's hard to comprehend sometimes. Um, and often these images I referred to in the beginning of our discussion, are kind of facile ways of just like, oh yes, that's what happened, without really bringing it down to the individual family um, unit um, and that experience um, uh, and, and what the photographer witnessed and how it completely traumatized him and the trajectories of that, right, into these families um, and into our present day. And so I, I you know, if you start with the small, you know, uh, these, these big uh, stories, these big discoveries will inevitably emerge. And it's that, it's not like tinkering. It's not as if we know the big story and we're just kind of, you know, filling in the gaps. I, I think we're really, we're uncovering big pieces of the story. Um, and that kind of assumption that we know all there is to know, oh, not another book on the Holocaust, when in fact, most of the documentation on the Holocaust is just being like declassified now, certainly from the non-German um, kind of participants in non-German archives and from the former Soviet Union. Um, and so we still have to pursue, I mean, the Vatican archives right now is just in the last year has been accessible. I mean, in part when COVID has shut down a lot of that, but it's open and those stories are starting to come out. We're gonna learn more about that. Um, so there's just these histories to be pursued, um, which provide that window into some of these bigger um, phenomenon, as well as we are living in real time and seeing the repetition of mass atrocities and genocide, it raises new questions and we go back to the archives with, the new, with new eyes. Um, and so, yeah, this book is also about how we um, do research with all these different methods. And Raul Hilberg, who had mastered the Nazi documentation and his seminal work, his foundational work on the destruction of European Jews decades ago. Um, uh, and I draw so much inspiration from him and have the opportunity to interact with him. And he, he you know, he, he's like that little voice in my head. Um, but, you know, he, he never, is, he created this masterpiece of a three volume work. But in my interactions with him, you know, he was, would, I'd see him in the archives and he'd be looking at one document from one unit, like, and that was his starting point, or that was the spark of curiosity, and, and to let the material kind of go from there, and sometimes when you start with really um, big questions, you end up with small answers, and, and in any case, we are, you know, each project is that gain, is that a little bit more, um, and lastly, from an ethical standpoint, when you look at an image like this with that family unit, um, it's that small unit, but it's this big history. Like you could, how could, how could you say to an individual victim of any atrocity that, that you, you individual, your family, you know, your suffering was any worse than another family or another individual. Like for those people who suffered, it's a universe of, of hell. It's not, you know, little old me, like one, one piece. Um, it's, it's their world. Um, and that's, you know, one way of accessing it is, is, is through this, um, uh, very kind of smaller <laughs> approach. Well, I, I mean, I really think you do a, a marvelous job of using that small approach to, to tell a much larger story and an important story. Um, you know, I always struggle in our talks with, uh, with authors about how much does the author want to share about their book. And so I'm just going to pass the baton to you on this one. And that is to ask, I know you look at, try and find out who is the victim to name the victim in this photograph. On the one hand, I, I feel like I don't want you to tell people what you determine, uh, but I wanted to just ask you what you want to tell us about the victim. Hmm. Oh, wow. Well, um, 
I, I guess I, I'm just going to talk about what happened. I, I feel like it's not giving it away um, because I think there's there are a lot, a lot of facets to the book, yeah, um, uh, and a lot to be gleaned from it. But it's also a, an open-ended story in the way that Hilberg inspired us to keep digging and keep you know searching for those um, incremental gains. And for me, you know, the search was also for the missing, missing, and the challenge of trying to to when I when we talk about never again or combating genocide, you know, what can we do? People say to me, what can we do? What do we have within our means? I'm an historian, I'm a scholar. So within my means, um, I can set out to um, identify, try to identify those victims. Um, and I don't want to get it wrong, <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I hesitated. I didn't, I came very close and maybe some individuals will draw different conclusions and feel comfortable saying, okay, she found the victims. Uh, I was not going to go there. And it also gave me pause um, because there's this reality of over a million in Ukraine who were killed, um, half who have not been identified, children, no documentation. I mean, these are really needles in a haystack. And if I had, I had 960 people who were killed in these massacres and only 440 names on a list. Uh, so it's a partial list. And I still went for it, you know, um, uh, and I uncovered other families and other stories. Um, and, and I uncovered even in the photo, I identified more souls, you know. So the pursuit in and of itself is uh, worthwhile. It is an act of memorialization. It is the pursuit of knowledge and truth, and that's worthwhile. Um, but it's difficult when the genocide errors, when the agents behind this, um, and there's an agency here that we still live with today called anti-Semitism, and there's the fear of prosecution, and there's the fear among the collaborating nations that their nation's history is going to, it's too shameful to talk about. So pursuing this is a way of working against um, certain trends um, that I think my victims here in this photo, even though I could not with certainty identify them by name, I, I kind of um, have to believe um, that this work is um, some justice for them. Yeah, I mean, as you say, you. Um, even though you may not have identified the, the person, the persons in the photo, the victims in the photo, you do draw attention to a number of victims by name and draw attention to a, that group of people and bring them back to our memory. Um, I see there's a couple of quick questions that I know we need to wrap up, but one person is just asking the, uh, the, the women or the people you interviewed in Mirapol about the shooting and the, the survivor who, re who remembers being there. Were that, was that video testimony and was that saved somewhere? Is there a way that can be viewed by anybody? Uh, yes. Um, the interviews are available on the Yahan and Unum website. Um, they've posted some of the footage, including I think the woman I, I um, showed who some of the, the people photographed today that I showed you. Um, so by all means, yes, go to the Yahad and Unum um, org, and you'll see some more photographs about the investigation as well. Uh, so I've given them full, you know, rights to that. And um, I'm not trying to, I want people to have as much access to information as possible. Um, and as well at the Holocaust Museum, the interview with the photographer should now be available in the oral history department that I conducted with Lubmir uh, Scrove and his family. Um, so that's available as well. Um, and the Nazi documentation. And if you look at my footnotes, uh, I have some, some things I took on my own. People have been writing to me. I've been sharing whatever I have. Um, it's been a great, the book, the response to the book has been really terrific as far as grandchildren of um, Holocaust victims from these, from Ukraine, uh, recent college grads. <laughs> Uh, who realize this is part of their family history and they want to do more. I had someone write to me from Hebrew University who's a geneticist who wants to do DNA work. I have a ground penetrating radar specialist from Madrid. I have someone who wants to fund a, yeah. It's been a great experience as far as people just coming out and saying, 
uh, I have a connection to this history um, and I want to share it with you. And it's like, it's just like community starting to, I'm starting to build like a team maybe that might, we might be, there might be another epilogue, <laughs> right? Um, so that was very different from the response I got to Hitler's Furies, by the way. So it's, this has been uh, quite a, quite a, quite an experience. I am so grateful to uh, people who have written to me, uh, their reactions to the book, uh, mostly very positive. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time, even though there are, I'm sure, an endless set of questions that I and others could pose to you. But thank you so much for joining us. You in the audience, thanks for joining us as well. We are recording this and we will put it up on our YouTube channel for people to, to see if they aren't able to make it. But thank you, Professor Lauer, for joining us and for sharing us and for this book. Thank you. All right. Have a nice day, everybody. Have a good day. All well. Thank you.